Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's the man with the opinions as strong and as poorly directed as a Stan Hansen lariat, your boy, Jack Slack. And where the fuck have I been? A uh, really busy week, that's what it's been. Uh, I don't think we've done this. We didn't do last week, but we did do the week before, because we did Struve versus Volkov. That was fairly meh. Uh, and then there was UFC 215, which, I mean, I say this a lot, but maybe worst UFC pay-per-view ever uh, in terms of star power. Uh <laughs> Because Ray Borg dropped off the card. Uh, having had all that about Demetrius Johnson saying TJ Dillashaw needs to prove he can make weight, uh, he then fought Ray Borg, who's missed weight twice, and Ray Borg got the flu, um, so we didn't get that fight. I'm not going to rant on Ray Borg. You know, if, if a fighter's ill, they should make the decision not to fight, to be honest. A lot of them can't for where their career is, um, but, you know, you can't give him too much shit. Uh, give shit to the UFC for putting together such a wank event. But I really want to know the buy rate on this one. Um, so what happened then? Actually, we'll get onto that in a, mi- in a minute. We'll do some news first. Uh, the most pressing piece of news, I suppose, is that Yushin Okami has stepped in for Mauricio Shogun Hua to fight Ovin St. Pru in UFC Japan. Um, that should give you an idea of how stuck we are for light heavyweights. We went to a welterweight to find a replacement. A local welterweight. Um... I mean, I wasn't excited for Shogun vs. OSP 2 anyway. If I'm honest, two of my least favourite fighters to watch are headlining and co-headlining this card. You know, you've got um, Ovin St. Pru in the main event, and you've got Claudia Gedalia in the co-main event, and both of them are guys who are not great on the gas tank front, uh, and Ovin St. Pru, I've never seen him throw a combination in my life, except the 2-1-2s he threw against uh, John Jones, which were the only punches he actually hit him with. All the talent in the world... None of the aptitude for fighting. But anyway, yes, Yushin Okami, who was drummed out of the UFC due to being boring. Uh, <laughs> they're desperately trying to save the event with him. And I was watching um, the most recent fight night. And they've got Paul Felder, who I thought was pretty good. Uh, and Dominic Cruz and John Anik, Anik there. Um, and they're trying to talk about how exciting this fight will be. And uh, Dominic Cruz is going, you know, people don't appreciate how good Yushin Okami is because, and he saw him catch himself say because he's so boring and got kicked out of the UFC. Uh, and then he didn't say that. But how, how are you going to sell that fight? You know, the guy that you passed on re-signing, um, you brought him in last minute and you're supposed to be like, oh yeah, this is definitely worth the main event. But we'll get on to all that shit in our previews. What else is happening? Oh, John Jones' B sample came back positive. Everyone gasped in surprise. Uh, he was stripped of the title. DC was reinstated as champion. Um, but I mean, I put up a tweet about this saying, just waiting for John Jones to get a lesser sentence than Nick Diaz. That's the way commissions work. They just do the least sensible thing all the time. But we're going to get onto that in a minute too, because we're going to be talking about Canelo versus uh, Golovkin. I have, uh, personally, I have trouble with this whole thing when in the aftermath now that everyone's like well everything that john jones did is tainted uh you know he he isn't the best fighter in the world because he was on drugs the entire time and my view is they're almost all on drugs (laughs) you know a lot of these guys are on drugs a lot of them are just much better at hiding it than john jones i'm amazed that john jones is so bad at hiding it to be honest um but then i presume that's why he was on like a 1960s steroid that they only just made breakthroughs on the testing on and then caught him taking um east german steroid (laughs) That that always makes me laugh, because when I was clearing out a dead relative's um, house, I found uh, a gnome with Made in West Germany on the bottom. And I was like, oh, yeah, they, that's not even a country anymore. Um, but yeah, these German steroids, don't use them, kids. Especially if you're the only draw that the UFC has left outside of Conor McGregor. Hey, we got five minutes into the episode without bringing up Conor McGregor. We're doing good. Um, what else have... Oh, a bit more uplifting news. Uh, Jerome LeBanner the uh, great French heavyweight kickboxer, saved a man from lynching in Paris. Um, a guy drove up like a pedestrian street, uh, just driving like a bell end. it sounds like, uh, and almost hit some kids, and the crowd pulled him out and started beating on him, because obviously driving vehicles into crowds, in Paris particularly, is not going to go down very well. Um, fortunately, Jerome Le Banner was there, and I've sat... Just next to Jerome LeBanner before, and he is a gigantic dude. You know, they, you understand why they call him the the Hercules of K1. Um, just one of the biggest individuals I've ever seen in terms of muscle mass. Um, that wasn't like a, a bodybuilder or something like that. A hulking man. 
Uh, didn't have the best chin in the world, so it's good, good that he didn't get into the fight with the with the crowd, but um, still a very scary individual. In fact, I, I watched him, when was that? That was the Tokyo, no, it wasn't the Tokyo Dome, that was wherever I went to see the glory card he was on against some big Japanese bum. Um, but he took some serious shots in that, so he doesn't actually have that bad chin, uh, especially at heavyweight. But I just quite like that news story. You know, it's nice to hear that Sharon Laban is still out there doing awesome things, because he was really nice to me when I met him. Uh, just came out and sat next to me, and, uh, and we chilled for the Glory 8 card, I think it was. Didn't even bother changing out of his fight shorts, and he was walking around barefoot too. What a ledge. Um, and I was sat there in my suit. <laughs> Oh, and uh, interesting pieces of journalism news for those of you who are who have an interest in uh, how internet journalism is going and fight journalism go is going, um, which you probably should. I mean, it's fairly important to how a sport is covered. Um, what culture uh, announced a, a huge list of departures, including all their um, basically all the guys who run their pro wrestling stuff. I presume it's because they're going on to something different. Could be a restructuring of the company. You never know. Uh, a lot of guys are moving towards like video only content and things like that, uh, which brings us on to Fox Sports, which has had an enormous drop off in traffic since they went video only. Uh, most people reckon they probably got more in advertising revenue, but this is the whole thing that uh, we went through with Vice and Fox Sports. At the moment, uh, advertising on written content is difficult uh, because of people using ad blocker and things like that, and it's easier to advertise on video content because you work it into whatever you're talking about, or, you know, uh, you have the guy read out the advert so that people can't skip it. Problem with that is that a lot of people check these sites when they're at work, um, and you can't just start watching videos on your work screen. Uh, and if you're on the bus or something, you know, you don't want to have to put your headphones in to watch the video if you just want to scan for news. But, you know, as you might have guessed with the work I'm doing at Vice Sports at the moment, even though, you know, we said that they, uh, they'd they cut all the editorial, they are slowly bringing back in editorial almost immediately afterwards um, because it's a, an important part of, of covering sports and covering anything. Right, let's do some recaps. I know you're all dying to know what I thought of the UFC 215 main event between uh, Shevchenko and Nunes. Personally, it was one of those ones where... I feel like it was just MMA fans getting upset for the sake of being upset. Um, people use the word robbery about 20 times as much as they should. Uh, <laughs> and we'll get onto this with Gennady Golovkin versus Canelo later. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can't be up the, that upset about a fight whether it'll happen. I found myself drifting in and out of, of paying attention to this fight. Um, Shevchenko, obviously a very counter... Uh, heavy fighter she does a lot of just sort of standing and waiting for strikes she throws out the occasional snap snappy kick the occasional spin kick which often misses uh whereas nunez is much more meat and potatoes come forward with the power punches um but a lot of staring at each other a couple of takedowns uh i'm not gonna get too upset about that i'm just gonna put that whole division on the back burner and pay attention when something interesting happens Dos Anjos uh, put on a blinder against Neil Magny uh, right off the off the bat. That low uh, low low kick, as we call it, uh, takes Mag Magny off his feet. Magny, a guy with a really long reach, starting to use his boxing better. But of course, the more you try and employ boxing or classical boxing, the more you're opening yourself up to low kicks and off balancing techniques. Things where you using your feet to to use your punches properly uh, are going to is going to get you in trouble. Smothering top work from Dos Anjos, as always. Um, yeah, can't wait to see this guy continue at welterweight. It's really fun there. Obviously, huge um, height and reach discrepancy between these two men, but Rafael Dos Anjos does not look out of place at all at the weight class. He was a big lightweight. He looks like a big welterweight now. Um, really excited for his future. I'd still be up for the, Maywe uh, for the Meg <laughs> Mayweather fight. Fucking hell. I'd still be up for the McGregor fight. I'd be up for almost... Throw any name in with Rafael Dos Anjos and I'll, I'll say, yeah, I'm down for it. Um, because he's one of the most... Certainly that streak of, of wins at lightweight is one of the best ever achieved at that weight class. And most convincingly, too. Um, you know, we can talk about Conor McGregor and Tony Ferguson and people like that. But they didn't run through, what was it, Nate Diaz, Benson Henderson, Anthony Pettis. Prime Anthony Pettis. Um, and Donald Cerrone back-to-back, -back, uh, stopping three of them. Very impressive resume, and I'm glad that he's back on track. 
Jeremy Stevens versus Gilbert Melendez is one that people have been asking me about a lot, uh, mainly because of those low, low kicks. Um, these are starting to come into vogue so much. We saw them in the Rockhold versus Branch fight. We saw them in um, Usman versus Marias. Uh, again, in Dos Anjos versus uh, Magni, they're, they're really coming into vogue. And um, it's interesting that they've come into vogue almost over the course of like three events um, because they've been around for a, for a while. You know, um, Anderson Silva was showing them against Damian Meyer. That was his way of uh, attacking and scoring without any risk of getting his leg caught. If you kick the thigh, it'll ride up, uh, which obviously Anderson Silva uh, knocked out James Irving like that, uh, knocked down Chael Sonnen off a similar sort of technique. Um, but if you kick at the thigh, at the, at below the knee, uh, very hard for it to ride up. The guy will really have to reach down and time it well if he wants to grab it, and it's a very, uh, it opens him up a lot when he does it. The other advantage, of course, if you're in a nice long stance, it'll knock you off balance. Uh, those sort of like foot taps were just part and parcel of competition crafty stuff, you know, point sparring stuff, because you could get away with just tapping their foot and then moving in on them, which is something that I would have recommended Dave Branch do against Luke Rockhold or anyone do against Luke Rockhold, um, because he back skips in that very narrow stance. You can knock that lead foot offline and, and hold him in place or throw him off, off his stance uh, and move in with the right hand behind it. Wonderboy, I believe, used it a couple of times against Rory, and Rory would have done really well to use it against uh, Wonderboy because of his long stance and his, uh, and his backward movement. Um, Anyone who does a lot of retreating from a nice long stance, that little tap, uh, the skip up tap with the lead leg to the to the ankle or calf, uh, is a great technique to just stop them in their tracks or throw them off stance. Um, but like hard kicks into the into the lower leg are, are now coming into vogue as well too, um, for the same reasons. You know, very hard to catch, and it's interesting to think about because you are getting a worse connection on your end uh, as a kicker. You know, you're you, if you catch the calf, brilliant, dead leg all day. Um, if you catch, you know, if they turn their foot out and you catch the shin, you're going shin on shin, which is just not fun, <laughs> just generally. But shin on shin, there are degrees of it, you know. If you watch any of those leg breaks, it's always up near the top of the shin, almost under the kneecap, sometimes on the kneecap. You know, um, we talk about limb destruction, that old Jeet Kune Do idea, and then came out when... Um, Weidman uh, was working with Longo for the second silver fight, you know, put the knee on his shin. Uh, if you can get them to kick the really hard part of your knee or punch your elbow, you know, those are both, in some martial arts, they're called limb destructions. You know, in boxing, they just people call it a dirty trick. Um, in Muay Thai, it just be called the perfect check, I suppose. But, uh, you know, if you kick the, if you hit the really hard bits with your relatively, uh, you know, your, your softer bits, your shin and your fists, uh, you're going to do yourself some damage. The interesting thing about these really low kicks is that you can pick your leg up to check. You can't lower it. <laughs> so if you're kicking under the knee already, if you're kicking like mid shin area or mid calf area, um, they'll pick it up and you'll you'll crack the bottom of their shin, which is you know down by the ankle. Really not a fun place to take a kick anyway. Um, but you're never going to hit like the top portion of their shin or their knee, even if they pick it up and check, or even if they just turn it straight out to to meet you uh, as you kick them. So in some regards. A worse connection than if you caught like just meaty thigh um, but in terms of they're checking you it's not as bad as it could be but yeah Jeremy Stevens hobbled Gilbert Melendez right away with that uh, Gilbert Melendez has been looking worse and worse um, you know I think he's pretty much done now the only win he's got is recently is over Diego Sanchez who shouldn't really have been competitive with him to begin with uh, Diego Sanchez is so far done at this point um, but a very valiant performance by Melendez, ca carrying on and, and switching stance and just trying to walk forward, even though he clearly couldn't get any uh, weight in his blows anymore. Uh, that's the other thing about ta attacking the legs. People consider it as like an attrition tactic to make the guy quit. But if you pound someone's legs a little bit, if you can make it hard for them to move their weight around, uh, you take a good deal of the of the stank off their punches. And, and also it makes, them, it, makes it uh, easier to, to hit them, to get to them with, with takedown attempts, to tie them up, to cut the ring on them. You're just going to slow the guy down generally. Uh, almost all of your movement and your power comes from your legs. I thought a really good performance from Jeremy Stevens. Um, you know, we always joke about this before a Jeremy Stevens fight. He's had, well, it must be 26 or 27 fights in the UFC now with seven knockouts. You know, he's sold as this amazing knockout artist, but really he's more of a guy with a knockout chance. Uh, he very rarely actually catches the dudes, but... You know, he's got this tremendous power, but because he's always loading up and swinging wild, he never, ever knocks anyone out. Um, if anyone in the world could do with just B 
being a point fighter for a bit. It's Jeremy Stevens. You know, he's going to hit hard enough if he goes 50%. Uh, and if he starts getting ahead on the scorecards, guys will open up and he'll be able to hit them with the big blows. And I thought what you saw from him in, in this fight was really encouraging. Unfortunately, I think the heavy hands boys pointed it out, but unfortunately Jeremy Stevens has a habit of putting on a great performance, like the Barrow one was a really nice showing for him, uh, and then going on doing something really disappointing afterwards. Easily the most enjoyable performance of the night uh, came in the flyweight division, unexpectedly, uh, and it, I, I believe it took place on the main card? I can't remember, but Henry Cejudo versus Wilson Hayes was phenomenal. Um, lots of talk of Henry Cejudo getting the karate background now, uh, or getting some karate work in, uh, and a really good matchup in that sense. Uh, Wilson Hayes, uh, Southpaw, uh, Henry Cejudo, obviously looking to get off and take that uh, Gyakazuki reverse punch from the open side. Um, anytime you see like him or Wonder Boy um, going for the same sort of thing, Conor McGregor, same sort of principle with a little bit more of a boxing twist. Um, but basically, if, you, if you're in an open stance position or open position or whatever it is, um, Southpaw versus Orthodox, whichever one you are, if you can step out to their power side on the retreat and draw them out with a nice long straight or overhand, uh, you've got a huge window to punch through because all that's protecting their jaw and temple and body even on that side is their arm. They've got no back or shoulder to hide behind. Um, so you've got all that time as they extend and all that, all that time as they recover in which to catch them through that open side. Uh, Robert Whittaker versus Wonderboy Thompson. Same thing. Uh, all of Wonderboy fi Wonderboy's fights. Wonderboy against um, Johnny Hendricks. You know, same angle every time. And, uh, you know, no one owns this stuff. No, no martial art owns this stuff. But you will see it a lot in competition karate. If you watch some point style karate, which I don't recommend you do, it's incredibly boring and frustrating. But if you watch some, you'll notice that almost every time, as soon as they come out at the referee's instructions, uh, they get in stance and then one of them will probably change so that they're on the, you know, so that they're in an open position. Um, but everyone in competition karate is pretty capable of fighting off both stances uh, and they tend to just agree like tacitly between themselves to match up in an open stance position because everyone works with their back hands so well um you'll i mean you will see guys work from a closed position uh orthodox versus orthodox and southpaw versus southpaw but um overwhelmingly there is a there are open stance matchups in in high level competition karate so zahudo looked uh, uh, incredible in this fight he's actually got hands on him he's got uh, movement on him he just looked all around brilliant his knees as Wilson Hayes was sort of lumbering in for his for his shot uh, hips or clinch uh, just landed some beautiful knees on on Hayes um, and I thought he just looked phenomenal and I, I'm sure everyone else in the audience did too uh, he really stole the show um, and uh, combine this with his close uh, loss to Benavidez uh, he's looked really good all round um, a massive improvement because he he went into that fight with Demetrius Johnson with like one weapon and that was the wrestling you know and then when it turned out he couldn't keep him down uh, and he didn't he couldn't really keep up with the knees from the clinch and things like that uh, he really looked like a one dimensional fighter uh, now he's looking more like a fighter fighter you know and then of course there was Rockhold Branch which was last weekend um, competing with the Gennady Golovkin versus Canelo card which is rough but then it actually turned out to be a really good card really enjoyable um Kamaru Usman versus uh, Sergio Marias. Usman, I, I must have seen before because I watched all of these events, but uh, I could not remember him for the life of me. Um, and he came out in like that John Jones crawl. And I immediately thought, oh, here's a guy with the demeanor of a much better fighter. Um, but then he, he came out and proved that he was a very good fighter. So uh, I was very impressed by that. Again, kneecapped him with that, with that low, low kick. Uh, put Sergio Mar Marias on a wobbly knee right from the start. Uh, Marias hit him with a couple of nodders. Uh, Usman ran in to, to swing and he just duck his head and catch him in the face, uh, which was very strange because Marias was so much taller. But uh, if he wasn't doing that deliberately, he should have been doing that deliberately because it's a great way to calm down a guy who wants to run in and punch. Um, just it project a big ball of bone for him to run into face first because uh, the referee didn't call it. He didn't even see there was a, he a headbutt both times. But Usman did a very good job using the low kicks and also just cutting the cage. When he got uh, Marias to the cage, he'd step out with a stepping lead hook in whichever direction Marias moved, which I really like. That's really good ring cutting stuff. And then you follow up with the straight on the other hand. Uh, and he did. Uh, right straight caught Marias uh, to end the fight and sent him into a Granby roll. It was incredible. Um, so very good look for Usman. 
Uh, not a great look for Sergio Marias. He's going to be on uh, highlight reel for the rest of time with that one. Uh, Gonzalez versus G- Gillespie. Giuseppe? No, Gillespie. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, G- Gonzalez looked fucking huge. Uh, I I thought this was like uh, light heavyweight and maybe uh, G- Gillespie was a middleweight or something like that. He'd gone up. Uh, and then I saw that it said lightweight on the side and I was like, fucking hell. How big is this Gonzalez lad? Uh, came out really aggressive. Gillespie looked rattled early on, but really composed himself well. Came back and, and started putting it on Gonzalez. And then he didn't have to deal with the length too much because all his best stuff was happening in the clinch you know just as they'd come out of the clinch he'd land a nice right elbow wobble him um great ground game uh, and and opening the elbows from mount it's like uh, it's such a pain in the ass in jiu-jitsu trying to open the the elbows from mount normally you like put in a cross face uh you know uh, with your shoulder put the shoulder of justice in from mount reach across their back uh, turn their head towards the elbow that you want to open up and start trying to walk your your fingers up the mat with uh, the crook of your elbow underneath their elbow uh which takes time um, but in MMA, you just punch him in the face. <laughs> like he went, he went to crawl up for the arm triangle, and uh, got, uh, Gonzalez dropped his elbows again, and then he put a, a little punch into his face for an elbow. I can't remember what it was. And suddenly, Gonzalez's arms came up again, and he just moved straight into the arm triangle choke. Um, it's like Eddie Bravo always talks about with Maya. You know, the the three quarter mount is a much bigger deal, or the quarter guard rather, is much bigger deal in MMA because you can start punching the dude in the face on that side from basically mount. Uh, whereas in jiu-jitsu, you're, you're caught and you're just desperately trying to not be pushed back to half guard. Really good fight. Enjoyed that one a lot. Anthony Smith versus Hector Lombard. Really not overwhelmed by this. Oh, Hector Lombard was another one who was lighting up the guys just below the knee. Like all around, there was a ring of purple bruising all around Smith's uh, just below the knee. Um, really interesting in that regard. But you shouldn't be getting out kicked by Hector Lombard when you're... What was he, 6'4"? <laughs> and Hector Lombard's 4'10". Um, but uh, yeah, Hector Lombard got knocked out by a right straight. Same one he'd been eating for the rest of the fight he was fine with. Um, just caught him on time. Uh, really nice stuff. To be honest, I quite enjoy watching Hector Lombard lose because he was always such a... Uh, it always seemed like such a nasty piece of work in all his interviews and stuff. And if you ever see him working on the pads, basically, he seems like the kind of guy who just does whatever he wants... Uh, and and doesn't like being told what to do. He's telling his mitman what to do, and then if his mitman does something that he doesn't like, he tells him off, <laughs> and like loses his temper over it. Really, um, aloof guy. On the subject of uh, of heels, Mike Perry came out and starched Alex Hayes pretty quickly. Rays Hayes, uh, depending on where he's from. Um, having seen him against Ellenberger and thinking that he looked really quite technically crisp, you know, he was using that lovely step up left kick to the body, to the leg, to the rear leg. Um, and to the head uh, and then he landed that beautiful elbow off the clinch and he just looked so and he had a nice jam in that fight too actually uh, he just looked so much slicker than I'd seen him before and then in this fight he just lunges in from way out in the middle of the cage with a with a knee and comes in swinging um, and then does a, a, a rooster movement to uh, to celebrate and then says to the camera kids don't get tattoos on your face until you're old enough to live your dreams <laughs> um, so he's really winning me over uh, tremendously entertaining fighter. I hope he gets a little... Well, to be fair, Reyes is probably not as high on the uh, totem pole of people you have to respect in the cage as uh, a, you know established veteran like Ellen Berger, especially coming off that Brown win. Um, so maybe Perry didn't respect him very much, but uh, I'd like to see him return to a little bit more of a technical brawler style. And then finally you had Rockhold versus Branch. And uh, can we please stop the Rockhold was overconfident against Michael Bisping thing? Because he wasn't. It, well, maybe he was, but the things that got him caught were the same things here. You know, uh, leans back, throwing the, the right, the, the check hook, uh, and, and throws his body all the way off to the left, drops his left hand every time he throws, um, especially on the lead. He's so lazy on the lead with his hands. Um, not lazy, because I don't know if it's a conscious choice. I think it's just sloppiness. But, um, you know, his money punches that check hook, which he times really well. And because he's so long and tall, he can skip back and make a huge amount of distance. In the first fight with Michael Bisping, Bisping is literally running to try and keep up with him and getting cracked with this counter hook. Uh, where Bisping in the second fight, he circled a lot and stayed on the outside, took away the left kick, which is normally what Rockhold likes to do on the lead. He just likes to punt people uh, and then they'll come at him, he'll check hook them. Um, Bisping didn't come at him as much, tried to sit down, stay back a bit and make Rockhold come to him. When Rockhold came to him, he countered and uh, caught him and knocked him out. Um, but Branch, his corner were telling him to circle in or, you know, spiral in. Um, 
yes you know stepping outside the lead foot as you come in constantly going straight off to like that i don't know what is it 60 70 degree angle to the left uh but making sure that he was outside the lead foot every time he stepped in uh, it meant that when rockhold threw the the kicks it, he could just sort of ride them round. Uh, he wasn't ever in like the brunt of the kick um and it also meant that the check hook had to come really wide round to try and catch him you know he's checking the lead hand with his left hand as he steps in and rockhold's dropping the hand and swinging it all the way around behind him to throw the check hook and he got caught on the chin with a with a right hand as he leaned back to do so um got caught a couple of times throughout the fight uh, Branch was looking for the same opening over and over again. It was there, but obviously Luke's a big, tall guy and he's leaning back. It's quite hard to get to him. Uh, same thing that uh, Conor McGregor found with uh, Nate Diaz the first time. Uh, a taller guy leaning back, it's very hard not to reach and lean for them. You've really got to do your work with your feet and get on top of them before you throw the punch. I thought Rockhold's composure was outstanding, though. Uh, he looked... A little bit quick to tire in this fight. He was breathing very hard very early uh, and obviously he got caught very early. But I think that was more like a habit that he has uh, that got exploited. It wasn't like him having ring rust. But um, he looked very calm in the clinch. I thought he did brilliant work in the clinch. Every time he turned the fight onto the turned Branch onto the clinch, it looked like Branch wanted to grind there because he's a bit of a grinder. But uh, Rockhold was in control for most of it. Uh, every time he turned Branch onto the, clin onto the fence, uh, he'd get his head in under Branch's and throw his hips way back and he could throw good knees from there. Uh, and he landed a couple of good ones, but it would have been great to see him do that over like a five round fight. I think that really would have made a difference. Um, and then he kept looking for the outside trip, you know, very basic takedown on the fence. Uh, and then Branch obviously wasn't having it. So what he'd do was he'd go for the outside trip and then loop his leg all the way around to the inside of Branch's leg and try and throw him forward onto his hands. And then Branch would step forward and he'd just step in behind him and lift him. Uh, that's how he got him down both times. A really cool little combination that I'm trying to play with now. Um, I don't know the technical names, not a wrestler, but uh, I thought that was very cool. And then obviously Luke Rockhold's top control has always been incredible. Uh, and he, actually, in fact, uh, he got taken down at one point. And if you remember the Weidman fight, he gets a guillotine and holds it as Weidman moves to side control, which is something you're told never, ever to do. You know, Von Fluchoke, <laughs> that's the uh, Ovin St. Pru. Rockhold did it in the Weidman fight, just held on to it. And, and he was able to do it in the way that, like, he held on to it and it was clearly bothering Weidman. And Weidman couldn't advance his position anymore. And he was trying to bump his way back to guard the entire time. So it was almost like he had uh, Weidman's head in the noose and he was just trying to throw it over a tree or something. Um, good analogy. I'm going to use... Oh, I wish I'd used that in the article back at the time. But it was, like, three years ago. Um, so, yeah, Branch took him down on the fence and he immediately tried to guillotine him, even as Branch seemed to be moving past his guard. Branch pushes uh, pushes his hand off to, to free himself from the choke and Luke's hand immediately goes to the floor and he springs back up. It was a very cool little uh, uh, series of techniques and counter techniques, I suppose. Um, you know, that, that's just training with DC and Cain Velasquez and Noma Gomedov the entire time, I imagine. You know, he's got some very strong wrestlers and grapplers in that camp. And that's always been Rockhold's bread and butter. If you're going to beat him, you're going to beat him on the feet, probably. Um, because that is where he is. He likes working, but he has very big flaws. Or really just a limited bag of tricks that can be exploited quite well. But yeah, great showing. Uh, if you're giving Branch a hard time about tapping to strikes, I mean, it's not very sensible to keep fighting from that position if, you, if you've tried for a while to get out and you can't. Right? And there was time left in the round. I mean... I'm always on about corners should throw in the towel sooner. Uh, Gilbert Melendez is an interesting example because his corner didn't throw in the towel and then he got the fight of the night bonus, which basically encourages corners to not throw in the towel. But, I mean, you saw the beating that Weidman took without the fight being stopped in the Rockhold fight. Um, I think if you're just going to take a pasting and you're, with, uh, you're in with a guy as good as Luke Rockhold and you conceded a position as bad as that and you're not getting out of it, um, it's better to just tap. Like... It, Dave Branch is not done here. Like, this wasn't a title fight, you know? <laughs> so he's going to be able to come back another day and get better. Whereas if he'd taken uh, two, three, four minutes of punishment from there, or, you know, been beaten up woozy and made it to the next round and then got knocked out properly there, um, you know, that would take a toll on his, on his career and his life. So I'm not going to judge him, but uh, you're free to do whatever you want, obviously. So not a bad couple of weeks of fights uh, in MMA. Um, we'll talk about... Well, I've got a big Gennady Golovkin uh, Canelo question here, so we'll do that in a second. Um, but first, quick plug. If you are a Patreon boy, uh, last week when I didn't do the podcast, I, I did still put up the um, uh, history lecture, which is called The Axe Murderer. Um, it's uh, about, not specifically about uh, 
Vandalay Silva himself, but about Vandalay Silva through the uh, lens of the Pride 2003 Middleweight Grand Prix. So there's a lot of characters, a lot of moving parts. You got uh, Tito Ortiz looming over in the background. He's the UFC champion, but he's been absent for the best part of a year. Um, you got the Chuck and Randy rivalry starting over there. You got Chuck on sort of like a comeback, but not. Uh, you got it coming in as the UFC representative into the Pride Middleweight Grand Prix. Uh, but then you've got guys like Murillo Bustamante, UFC Middleweight Champion, left to join Pride, uh, stripped of his belt when he did so, uh, and uh, came into this tournament on five days' notice because his training partner, uh, Ricardo Arona, uh, injured his ankle. So on five days' notice, he says, OK, I'm not going to fight at middleweight, I'm going to fight at Pride Middleweight, which is actually like heavyweight. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've got Sakuraba, Quinton Jackson... Tons of other guys in there. Hidehiko Yoshida, one of my favourites. Really interesting tournament, and it was a really fun episode. So if you're a Patreon boy, go listen to that. If you're not a Patreon boy, consider becoming a Patreon boy. If you haven't picked up Notorious, it's the best book on fighting. About fighting, or, you know, it's, it's the best fighting book out there. Uh, go read it. Uh, and if you've not uh, bookmarked fightprimer.com or thefightprimer.com, uh, I own both, um, That that's the new website where... I am, I'm going to be doing another primer. Uh, the primer was the big thing I did for McGregor versus Mayweather. I will be doing those for really big fights, uh, but they take a lot of time. Um, and I'm also doing my post-fight notes series, so if you want to see my Rockhold uh, branch stuff, that's up there. I also did um, Koto versus Kamagai. Uh, and I'll, I'll just be doing bits and pieces when I'm not selling them to Vice or a magazine or something like that. Right, we're going to do some questions. Just a reminder, if you want to send questions to the podcast, fights gone by podcast at gmail.com. Hi Jack, in UFC 215, Jeremy Stevens did a number on Gilbert Melendez with kicks hitting b- below the knee. This seems like an effective technique with less risk than cu- uh, targeting the thigh, where the defender can hurt the kicker with a good check lifting up the knee a la the, the quote-unquote destruction Weidman used on Silver. What's the best defense against a kick aimed to the, below the knee? What are the drawbacks of this type of kick versus kicks aimed at the upper thigh? Why isn't the low, lower kick used more often? Cheers, Holden. Uh, okay, Holden. Bit of stuff we talked about earlier, sorry about that, I, I did overlap a bit. But yeah, as, as we said, obviously, if you raise the knee, the knee to check, you're not going to catch... They're, they're not going to kick into the really hard bit of your of your shin and knee. Um, but the downside is, of course, you are connecting shin to shin a lot of the time, as opposed to some of the time. You're, not, you're never getting that nice uh, naked connection on the thigh. Um, the other downside is that... Well, I think the, the reason that this technique's coming into vogue so much is partly because it's very hard to grab a hold of. It's a very non-committal technique. Um, but, well, it's not really non-committal in terms of weight, but it's non-committal in terms of you're probably not going to get taken down off it or counted off it. Um, or counted in the step in and throw the right hand since. But I think this is really just exploiting a move towards longer stances, a move to more, war, towards more boxing-heavy centric uh, styles. Someone I don't think you'll see get caught with one of these, or very many of these, is Darren Till. He's got that very sort of old-school tie style where rather than checking kicks, he just retracts the lead leg, throws the hips back, you know, draws in the lead leg, sticks his face out and mugs. Um, I think that style of defense is probably the best against this sort of low kick. I mean, if, if Gilbert Melendez had been able to do that against Jeremy Stevens, Jeremy Stevens was throwing him hard because Jeremy Stevens throws everything hard. So he'd be really over committing and, and throwing all the way through. If he missed, he'd probably just end up way out of position. Um, if you watch uh, really good ties, that's what they do. And if you retract that leg... Um, what you'd want to be thinking about really is kicking into the open side. So if you retract the leg and uh, you think that you can throw the right foot in like to their head or body uh, wh- while they're over committing on the kick, that's what you do. If you think you can time them so that when they retract the kick, you can catch them on the left side with your left kick to the head or body, that's what you do. Um, but retracting the lead leg and coming back in with the kick and then some punches afterwards, probably the best sort of answer to that. Or if you watch... Um, for a little bit more of a uh, Kyokushin take on it, Andy Hoog's instructionals years ago, uh, he used to... Well, if you've seen uh, some of the really old school ties... Actually, no, even modern ties do it, but... Uh, actually, I've, this is a good chance to bring up a video I was watching this week. Uh, Sylvie sent me it. Sylvie Douglas E2, or Von Douglas E2. I cannot say her full name. I'm terrible with names. But that's how you know you're a real part of the Fights Gone By podcast. If, if you get your name butchered by me, you're part of the, of the, uh, of the podcast proper. But uh, she did an amazing uh, video... Well, she's doing this whole uh, Legends library where she visits various uh, Muay Thai legends and films them, and they're for her Patreon um, subscribers. So if you, I would definitely recommend going and joining up to that. I've seen the Karahat one. I uh, sat down for two hours and watched that. It was amazing. And I've seen some of her stuff with Diesel Noy, um, who is obviously the, the knee legend. 
Um, but yeah, the Karahat was stuff was all on changing stances uh, because he was trying to get Sylvie to step forward and clinch with her right arm instead of her left arm uh, and trying to teach her to, to walk forward from a southpaw stance, like wedging her way in uh, and then countering off that southpaw stance was really interesting. Um, I really like stance switching to set up counters. I think that's great. Uh, Andy Risty used to do it a lot, but he was doing this thing where he'd throw the... From the southpaw versus orthodox stance, he'd throw the... Uh, he was orthodox. He'd throw the right leg inside kick to the fr- uh, to Sylvie's front leg and Sylvie was supposed to uh, like swing the leg back in a, in a circular motion almost like comp- completing the um, almost like a figure of eight sort of or half figure eight a, a serpentine whatever um, but like uh, he'd swing in his, his right kick she'd swing her right leg back and then she'd come in with the right kick afterwards uh, and I really like that but uh, it reminded me of something that Andy Hook did uh, on his instructionals back in- oh it might have been a seminar I saw with him but anyway we're all over the place Andy Hook used to like take the inside low kick or, uh, and swing his leg back with it and then spin straight into the wheel kick. Um, obviously helps if you're Andy Hug, um, but just a really cool look off that sort of um, taking the kick or, or retracting from the kick counter. I've got another question uh, in the same sort of vein from uh, a Russian name. It's half in English and half in squiggly. Uh, Hi, Jack. How to deal with low kicks uh, if you're fighting in a bladed stance? In your opinion, what are the best setups for landing low kicks in MMA? Is there any chance we will see a Jake LaMotta breakdown from you? Oh, that's a little bit off topic. Um, Yeah, low kicks generally. I mean, for years we've been saying learn to check them because that's like the basic thing. But obviously movement it, anything that sets up counters better is best for you so sometimes that's if they're kicking into the thigh that's stepping inside and landing the right hand if they're uh if they're just standing there after their kicks you can check and come in with the left hook or check and come in with another kick if they're really over committing on the kicks and you're struggling to check them pull the leg back and work from like that square legged stance come back in with something else um you know, there's always options for everything. You can't just say that there's one answer for something because obviously there isn't. Um, regarding uh, setups, I, I like body body shots into low kicks. Um, Mahasakurai, uh, Jose Aldo, lots of guys good at that. Uh, I also really like what um, Justin Gaethje does nowadays, uh, which is just walk dudes down. And, and hammer them as they step out along the fence. Uh, if you saw, well, returning to Henry Cejudo, Henry Cejudo's first fight with Demetrius Johnson, he says, assuming they're going to get a second one. Um, but a constant theme with Demetrius Johnson's style is that he doesn't really deal with low kicks very well. Um, Wilson Hayes landed like 70% of his low kicks thrown. He threw like 14, landed 12 or something like that. But Demetrius Johnson's constant movement means that he's often not in position to brace for low kicks, they can knock his legs out of the way, uh, and also he's not in position to check, often not really thinking about retracting the leg. If you're going to be retracting the leg from kicks, you really want to be there ready waiting for them. It's more like a a thing you're waiting to do rather than something you're doing as a reaction. Um, But Henry Cejudo did a a nice thing where he was backing him towards the fence and then uh, Demetrius Johnson broke his stance, started sidestepping out, uh, and he punted the rear leg, which is a great... Any any time you fight any one who's fighting like uh, Demetrius Johnson, T.J. Dillashaw, uh, less so Dillashaw actually, uh, Dominic Cruz, people like that who like to when they hit the fence they step out into the sidestep, you know, Willie Pep style. Um, well, actually, anyone you can put to the fence will step out and sidestep eventually. But anyone who really likes that a lot, um, punting the trailing leg is a great thing to do, and that's more to do with ring position really than anything else. Um, but I also like Gaethje just walking guys down, taking their punches and then landing the low kick in, the, in return, especially if guys are really into their boxing technique. Uh, you won't see kickboxers generally pivot on their punches as much. Uh, guys who are really into punching, whether they be kickboxers or boxers, they will pivot on their foot. And that's when you can slam a kick into the back of the knee. If you take it on the guard, throw the, uh, the kick into the back of the leg, that's always a, a good chance of jarring the guy's knee. Or hitting the hamstring, which is obviously very tender. Uh, regarding Jake LaMotta, uh, I was reading screenplays this week because I thought, fuck it, might as well write one. Um, and I was reading Raging Bull. Uh, <laughs> not really on topic, but I just really like that film. Good film. Uh, Jake LaMotta, really interesting guy. If you watch, there's a great clip from one of his last fights when he was really past it. Uh, he just invites some guy to throw punches at him and he slips all of them. Like, so he was very underrated defensively. Uh, and I think having that amazing chin and being so comfortable taking punishment, uh, it makes you a lot less panicked in the pocket you know guys who can take those shots uh, if they put in the time you know they're going to be comfortable under fire so they might as well just learn to to slip the shots um but yeah lamotta great fighter 
Um, still alive, I believe. He's like 90-something. But, um, yeah, it'd be really interesting to write something about him. Uh, obviously, his story intertwines nicely with Sugar Ray Robinson's. Um, yeah, I'll do something for it, history-wise, soon. Maybe for, maybe for Vice. I don't know. Next question. Where you at, Jack? Please put me out of my misery. I don't understand who won that fight. I initially scored it 115-113 for Triple G, but after watching it back, I can see that it could have been a draw and arguably a Canelo, a Canelo win. Uh, what's more important, ring generalship and defence a la Canelo, or aggression and shots thro uh, landed slash thrown a la Golovkin? Uh, when is Golovkin's jab a significant strike or not? Was this fight simply a case of father time catching up with Triple G? His right hand seemed slow and jabs weren't as crisp. Uh, or did Canelo's defence and countering shut Triple G's game down? Uh, was Canelo's plan to make Triple G miss and take him in the later rounds, but Triple G's conditioning and superhuman chin stopped that from happening, and Canelo actually gassed more? Uh, help us understand. Thanks, Chris. Um, obviously, I think you've got to be careful any time we talk about this fight, because I don't think it was anywhere near a blowout. Um, what I saw watching this fight was Triple G coming forward behind... Actually, a side note, I know people get mad, some people get mad when I talk about historical boxers, but whenever you read about like Daniel Mendoza who was like the first scientific boxer supposedly I mean a lot of people claim that title but he fought with this really weird double forearms guard and people commented on how unusual it was at the time uh with both his elbows forward uh, and if you watch Golovkin fight he does that like he, his right elbow is way forward of his body at all times which can make him a little bit um susceptible to the to the left hook to the body um the guy he knocked out in two rounds a couple of, uh, a year or two ago he he landed some good ones and then um Danny Jacobs landed a load of really good ones, both from Southport and Orthodox. Um, but what it means is that he's got his forearms up right in front of his head. He can just walk forward through anything. And he can snap off that really quick jab off it too. Um, and it, it, re it looks just like what you read about Mendoza, except Mendoza like back-knuckled people instead of actually fully jabbing them. Um, and that's how you walk down Canelo. It's really nice. Um, what this fight looked like to me was Golovkin coming forward, not opening up too much wanting to peck with the jab most you know he was pressure fighting but pecking it was really weird in that regard but um he'd land the occasional flurry but it was very limited flurries he'd throw like a couple of jabs a right hand and a left hook to the body and then he'd just go back to jabbing for the rest of the round you know um but he kept walking canelo's ropes it looked like canelo was looking for counters and not finding them uh and that's part of the pecking jab, you know, it's a very safe punch to stand behind. But also he just kept putting his back to the ropes, inviting uh, Golovkin in. And like, if you watch, the, I think it was the fourth round and the fifth round or the fifth round and the sixth round, he basically gives away two rounds by heading to the ropes, standing there, slipping and weaving and, and waiting for uh, Golovkin to overcommit. And Golovkin stands back and just pecks at him with jabs and these short right straights that are more like jabs, really. Um... So, yeah, really weird in that regard. He does land a couple of good counters off the, off the ropes. Um, but really where you saw Canelo do his best work was when he came forward and infight, infought. Infighted? Infought, yes. Um, I thought the infight would be an area where Golovkin might be able to test Canelo more. Uh, it turns out that was the area where Canelo did best. When he actually kept his back foot firm, didn't go to the ropes, pushed his head into Golovkin's, uh, which Kenny Bellis obviously freaked out about because he's a shit ref. Um, but when he actually got in the kitchen with Golovkin and banged the body, uh, what happened was that Golovkin's elbows had to come down out of that very high elbow guard, uh, and then his head was open to, to punch. And that's where you saw those nice short right hooks and, and uppercuts connect. Um, but he only really did that in like the last three rounds and for little bits at the start of previous rounds. Um, I'm not like going to tell you that one guy should have clearly won it. I On my personal card, I think I had uh, Golovkin ahead, but I don't really care about scoring round to round. I try and just, I'm just looking to see what's going on in the fight as a story. Um, but I think I, I had Golovkin winning overall, or, like out of the rounds, because he, he came forward and Can Canelo just wasn't connecting the punches. Um, but Golovkin was fighting aggressive but cautious which was interesting to watch um and canelo was never like in trouble but also really failing to find the openings that he wanted i could have scored it a draw easy like i'm I'm not bothered about the draw um i think that to be honest that's a good result because both guys did great work and it was a constant feeling out like they were growing and learning and trying to uh you know get the better of each other um but the the adelaide bird card is is pretty 
disgusting. Uh, what was it, 118 to 110? Uh, she had him winning, she had Canelo winning nine rounds. And I don't think, I can't think of which ones you would give him. She gave him, like, I think round five or round six. One of those ones where he was just on the ropes doing nothing. Um, so, yeah, a pretty either corrupt or so inept that she should never be allowed to judge again. There's always this thing after any big uh, blow up blow up in boxing, like Russell Mora allowing uh, Egbeko to get hit in the dick 30 times. Uh, anytime one of those things happens, the head of the commission, who is always just a friend of the governor, like that, that's how you get that job, uh, comes out and says, I assure you it is not corruption, it is just plain incompetence. She's going to be allowed to judge again, or he's going to be allowed to ref again, or whatever. <laughs> They'll learn from their mistakes. They had a bad night. Uh, like, that makes it okay. Uh, and Adelaide Bird, I think someone was telling me she'd been the dissenting party in six split decisions since 2016 or something like that, um, which doesn't sound like too many, but really shows you that she has uh, the wrong opinion a lot of the time, or doesn't agree with the majority a lot of the time. Um an interesting point someone came up with was why not just have more judges go for quality is for quantity over quality because you're going for like there's nothing should make a judge special it shouldn't be like he's a remarkable judge it should be he judges just like everyone else he's consistent you know um so the more people you have doing it the better the scores will average out um I know that sometimes in the Olympics they had five judges around the edge, sometimes they had three. Uh, we have three in professional fights. I would be interested to see, like, put two on every side. That would be amazing. Just eight judges and see what happens. Oh, no, but you have, a, you have to have an odd number, don't you? I forget. But it was just like that when I went to watch the Olympic boxing uh, in the London Olympics. You know, the scores were so far off each other. You were just like, that's bullshit. Um... But that's the problem with boxing. It's never been the lads in the ring fighting. It's always been the people around them. It's the guy. It's the promoters who won't put together the big fights because they can milk cash out of stupid punters um, for fights that they shouldn't be taking. Uh, and it's the commissions just letting idiots judge fights and ref fights. Oh, and the you know the people who make all the belts. Um, everything is shit about boxing except the actual boxing. A couple of interesting looks from uh, Canelo. He kept doing that pivot off the right hand, which is something you saw a lot from Koto in his middleweight career. Um, with bigger guys, you don't want to let them start putting together more and more punches. So what he did was he'd wait for the right hand, roll behind his shoulder and pivot out at the same time uh, and just completely change the angle and the other guy would have to reset and come back to him. So he'd be pattering off punches at them, stepping out the side door. And then when they started, get, when they actually got something going, they'd throw their right hand and he wouldn't be there anymore. Uh, and that's what Canelo was doing against Golovkin. So Golovkin was very measured with his right hand after that. Like uh, I put together a GIF compilation of all the all, all the pivots in this fight. There were a lot. Um, but most of the time, Golovkin was just working behind his jab and, and short body shots and things like that. Didn't really do a whole heap of power punching. This fight would have been fascinating bare knuckle, though, because that was the whole uh, Mendoza thing. Actually, we got an episode on Mendoza. It was the second one I ever did, the history episode. Um, but Mendoza's whole thing was that he took the blows on his forearms and then he'd wrap off a quick back knuckle to the eye and he'd just swell guys' faces to the point where they couldn't see anymore and then he could start unloading on them. Uh, it would have been interesting to see this bare knuckle. Some bare knuckle boxer was challenging uh, either Canelo or Golovkin after this fight uh, to BKB rules. I, th I thought that'd be really funny. Um... But Golovkin might actually suit BKB rules because, uh, you know, he doesn't have to deal with body shots a lot and he, he does a very high guard, so he's looking after his face. Um, yeah, interesting. I think Canelo could have taken the fight if he, if he went to the in-fight more or if he realised earlier that the in-fight was where he could win it. Um, but again, his punching form seems to tire him a lot more than Golovkin's does. But the fight absolutely lived up to expectations and if they had the rematch, fuck it, I'll watch. Right, quick previews of what's going on this weekend. Uh, obviously, we've got that awful UFC Fight Night 117 card from Japan uh, because the UFC really phones it in when they go to Japan. Uh, who we got? Mizuto Hirota, why? Uh, against Charles Rosa. Uh, Rolando Dai versus Teruto Ishihara, the meme lord. Uh, I heard that he's not very popular in Japan anyway. Uh, and then you've got Gohan Saki with his 0-1 record on the main card against Henrique De Silva, who is chinny, so that's that's po a positive, I suppose. Uh, you've got Takanori Gomi versus Dong Hyun Kim, the one that's not the usual Dong Hyun Kim. Uh, Takanori Gomi, please retire. I mean, he was on a he was on the skid before the UFC even signed him up, but they're just keeping him around so that Japanese shows can't use him, um, which I've been saying for the last five years. Uh, Claudia Gadelia versus Jessica Andrade. Do love Jessica Andrade. Um, 
but Claudia Gedalia may just lay all over her, as she often does. Uh, and then Ovin Simpru versus Yushin Okami. Uh, you'd hope Ovin Simpru could knock out the guy who fights at welterweight. Um, but, ooh, if that one goes five rounds, that's going to be hard work. Uh, Yushin Okami, back in the day, people used to be like, oh, one of the best users of the jab in MMA. But really all he did was just step in with the right jab over and over again. <laughs> and as soon as he fought Anderson Silva, Anderson just waited on it and hit him with a counter jab, knocked him down. More interesting is Bellator 183. My boy Benson Henderson's fighting Patricky Frere, the other one, the one that he didn't have the controversial... Well, not really controversial, because he can't really argue with the injury stoppage, but he had a, a fight where he was having a really hard time with um, Patricio Frere, um, and then uh, a checked kick made all the difference. Obviously, Benson's had that amazing fight with Michael Chandler since then. Um, real five-round war. Patricky's just knocked out uh, Josh Thompson, slightly aided by a, a headbutt, a cheeky nodder, but, you know, you can't complain too much about that. Uh, and he'd just been starched by Michael Chandler before that in probably one of the better performances of Chandler's career. So that division's still fairly interesting, the Bellator lightweight division, even though they lost Will Brooks um, and obviously Eddie Alvarez a long time ago. Um, Co-main event, Paul Daly versus Lawrence Larkin. That's a really good fight. I do love the Bellator welterweight division as it is at the moment. Um... But Paul Daly's back in the news talking about Michael Venom Page. He's just like, it's not going to happen. Let's just get over it. Michael Venom Page is going to retire having fought no one of note. Um, and now he's going to boxing to fight no one of note as well. Um, but I like that one. Paul, you know, Paul Daly, obviously, all about the left hook. Lorenz Larkin, um, really good with his left leg. Uh, as, you know, fights a lot of his fights in southpaw stance. So it could be interesting to see if Daly can even get to him with the left hook. Uh, against... Um, Douglas Lima, who has a great left hook, uh, he was doing some really interesting things like checking across with the other hand, switching stances occasionally. Um, yeah, I thought it was interesting. I like that fight. I don't know. Well, I don't know what to expect, but I, I will be watching it. Roy Nelson fighting uh, the guy who knocked out Sergi uh, Sergei Haritanov most recently. Meh. Uh, and then Aaron Pico is making his his re debut against Justin Lin. Um, not an awful lot else going on that card, but I'll, yeah, I'll give it a watch. I, I'm probably about. Well, no, I'd, I'd say I'm more interested in Bellator this week than I am in the UFC. And so should you be. Right, what else are we up to this week? Um, I'm finishing a big magazine piece for Battles of London. Uh, pick up their magazine when it comes out uh, on the Queensbury rules uh, and the Marcus of Queensbury himself, who was a fascinating character. Working on something for uh, Fighters Only 2. Um, and then I'll be doing some Vice stuff too throughout the week. So eyes peeled. Uh, sign up to the Patreon if you want to get in on the uh, history lectures. By Notorious if you want to read the best fighting book ever written, uh, according to me. Uh, bookmark thefightprimer.com or fightprimer.com uh, because I'm trying to put something out there every week at least. Uh, and if you want to send a question or email to the podcast, send it to fightsgonebypodcast at gmail.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack. Uh, this has been episode 52, I believe, so we've done a year's worth now. Uh, and thanks for your support and I'll catch you next week. Cheers.